Welcome to the Asia Economist, a webinar series from DBS Group Research. I'm Taimur Beg, Chief Economist. Today, I have the pleasure of having with me our economist, Ting Ma. Ting will talk to us about a fascinating subject, and it relates to Taiwan and how Taiwan's economy and the tech sector in particular is shaping up for the post-pandemic world uh, with the major geopolitical as well as pandemic-related realizations setting in. Uh, and once Ting is done with her slideshow, I will have some follow-up questions for her. But for now, it's over to you, Ting. Um, thanks, uh, Taimo. Uh, yes, indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, created some new opportunities for the tech sector. Um, but at the same time, it has also brought some uh, new challenges. So in this webinar, we are going to use uh, Taiwan as an example. The key content we are going to cover include uh, First, uh, the, the current stage of the tech supply chain. And second, the post-pandemic opportunities in the global tech sector. And third, why we think uh, Taiwan will benefit. And in the later part of the webinar, we are going to look at the other side of the pandemic impact, the rise in tech protectionism, nationalism, as well as the challenges for Taiwan. On slide three, we show the current stage of the tech supply chain. If we look at the two charts on this page, we will find out uh, the tech sector in fact was not affected very much by COVID. Taiwan is the major producer of uh, semiconductors in the world. If we look at Taiwan's exports of uh, semiconductors and other electronic components, in fact, they may take uh, steady and uh, strong growth. 20% young year in the uh, first uh, six months of uh, 2020. And mainland China is the largest producer of computers, mobile phones, consumer electronics in, in the world today. If you look at uh, China's exports of these products, they fell uh, just temporarily in January, February due to the COVID outbreak and the closure of Chinese factories. But there was a rebound starting from uh, April China's exports of uh, computers surged as much as uh, 50% in, in April and May. So why the tech sector performed well during COVID? On slide four, uh, we make explanations. We break down the source of uh, tech demand into three major categories. First, uh, uh, computers and consumer electronics. Second, mobile phones. And third, digitalization, automation, and uh, other new technology areas. During COVID, demand for computers and uh, consumer electronics rose very strongly. Uh, many people went to buy like PCs, laptops, or even monitors due to a need for remote work and uh, distance learning. Meanwhile, there was also um, more purchase of like uh, uh, gaming devices audio equipment because uh, uh, people spend more time at home. This kind of uh, uh, pandemic-related purchase should be a one-off phenomenon, and it may not uh, persist uh, over time. After a strong rise this year, uh, we may see some kind of uh, pullback in the demand for computers and consumer electronics in, in 2021. For mobile phones, demand, uh, in fact, remained sluggish during COVID. If you remember the, the chart on the private page, uh, China's exports of mobile phones, uh, in fact, uh, uh, contracted persistently in the first five months of 2020. The difference for the uh, mobile phone segment is that the, the ownership ratio is already high today. Um, the global small phone market, in fact, has been largely driven by the upgrade demand in recent years. But now due to COVID, the uh, job loss, income declines, so consumers upgrade to uh, new smartphone models could be uh, postponed. So basically for the mobile phone segments, we think it will um, correlate with the global GDP trajectory. A significant decline is expected for this year and it could be followed by a moderate rebound in 2021. The third area is about uh, digitalization and uh, automation. During COVID, demand for uh, networks, uh, cloud services, 
uh, data centers has uh, increased very strongly. This was due to the need for uh, video streaming, virtual conference, e-commerce, online entertainment, and other digital services. Meanwhile, there was also rising demand for um, robots uh, and also like autonomous uh, vehicles because of the need for automated delivery, automated uh, disinfection. Going forward, the demand related to digitalization and automation could remain strong for, for quite some time. Uh, as long as the various uh, risk remains in place, some kind of uh, large scale conference or events may remain virtual in the uh, short to medium term and consumers will continue to prefer the contextualized solutions. So demand in the new technology area could continue to grow in 2021. Slide five. Um, as the application of uh, cloud 5G or like AI IoT uh, increases, we should also see some kind of rising demand for uh, electronic components such as uh, servers, chips, or, or like sensors. In fact, if you look at it from a long-term perspective, global ICT exports have been increasingly driven by electronic components in recent years. In the 1990s, uh, global ICT exports were mainly driven by computers, consumer electronics, due to the emergence of uh, internet and PC. In 2000, the driver has uh, uh, shifted to mobile phones because of the rise of uh, smartphones. More recent years, the driver has uh, shifted further to electronic components, which uh, reflects the uh, new wave of technology innovation in the uh, ICT industry, which is led by uh, 5G, AI, and uh, IoT. So the COVID crisis probably will uh, reinforce this uh, existing trend of uh, innovation and uh, structural change. Slide six, we explain why we think Taiwan will be a major beneficiary. Taiwan has a very well established uh, semiconductor supply chain. Uh, it ranges from the upstream IC design to the downstream uh, fabrication, packaging, and testing. There are basically uh, four types of uh, semiconductor firms today. One is called uh, Fabless. They specialize on IC design. In this area, US is a leader and uh, is followed by Taiwan. The second type uh, is called uh, Foundry. They specialize on IC manufacturing. For this area, Taiwan is a dominant player. Its global share is as high as 70%. The third type is uh, OSAT. The full name is uh, Outsourced uh, Semiconductor Assembly and Test. This company is mainly conducts the assembly and uh, testing of uh, chips, which is on the uh, downstream of the semiconductor supply chain. Taiwan also plays a very dominant role in this area. Global share is uh, 50 percent. The fourth type is called uh, IDM, Integrated Device Manufacturer. These companies provide a package of services from design to manufacturing to assembly and test. The IDM companies today uh, are mainly from US, Japan, and uh, South Korea. Slide seven, we provide more details the major countries and companies in the semiconductor supply chain. For Fabless, many US companies here, like uh, uh, Broadcom and Qualcomm. There are also some Taiwanese names like uh, MediaTek. For Foundry, uh, Taiwan's uh, TSMC is an industry leader. Currently, only TSMC and uh, Samsung are able to produce chips at uh, five nanometer which is the most advanced uh, uh, process node. OSAT, also many Taiwanese names here, like uh, ASE, which is the uh, number one OSAT company in Taiwan. For IDM, uh, some uh, quite well-known US and Japanese companies like uh, Intel and uh, Toshiba. 
We also want to mention that uh, there are some other important companies uh, involving in the semiconductor supply chain. They don't produce uh, uh, semiconductors, but they provide the equipment and chemical materials used for semiconductor production. In these two areas, semiconductor equipment and the materials, many companies are from US and Japan, and also like uh, uh, European countries, uh, Netherlands. So why are Taiwanese companies so competitive in the semiconductor sector? On slide eight, uh, we make uh, further explanations Taiwan's uh, competitiveness uh, is supported by its very strong technology capabilities. As we know, the um, chip manufacturing set process is um, highly complicated and uh, capital intensive. The design cost of a three nanometer chip is um, 500 million to 1.5 billion uh, US dollar. For companies to move from uh, 14 or 16 nanometer to five nanometer, already means uh, increasing the cost by four times. Moving to three nanometer could be uh, 10 times. As the capital outlay is so high, so only the companies with uh, proven uh, technology capabilities could take the risk to invest, invest in the uh, most cutting edge areas and to stay competitive. On slide nine, we move to the uh, later part of the discussion, which is about the other side of the uh, COVID impact on the global tax sector, tech protectionism and uh, nationalism. As we know, the US-China tech war is now back to the fore due to the uh, deterioration in China-US relations after a uh, COVID-19 outbreak. The U.S. has already taken many measures against uh, Chinese tech companies uh, last year. It imposed uh, export controls on China's uh, telecom company Huawei, and it also issued an NTT list banning some Chinese companies and institutions from assessing U.S. technology. This year, after the COVID outbreak, U.S. Uh, took further actions. Uh, it broadened the ban on Huawei, requiring uh, foreign companies, not only American companies, but also foreign companies supplying to Huawei to seek for a, a license. And they also expanded the NTT list to cover more Chinese companies and uh, institutions. On the China side, uh, last year it announced to also establish a so-called unreliable NTT list that may involve some kind of uh, retaliatory measures like uh, investigation or restriction of the uh, local sales of uh, foreign companies in, in China. So far, this list has not been implemented. So this year, whether China will activate the NTT list and include some uh, American tech companies, uh, this is something uh, we may need to uh, closely watch uh, in, in the next several months. Slide 10, another development after COVID we want to mention uh, is that uh, more countries are now starting to reconfigure their supply chains. COVID has uh, exposed the uh, vulnerability of uh, global production networks during crisis. So many countries now find it necessary to localize production to increase uh, self-sufficiency in the critical sectors. In the US, we see that uh, the government is now calling for the reshoring of uh, uh, semiconductor production. Lawmakers have proposed the so-called um, uh, Chips for America Act recently. Uh, this bill of, will offer um, tax incentives government grants and R&D funding in the next uh, five to 10 years to encourage companies to build uh, um, cheap facilities in the US. In China, it has also set a goal to uh, boost uh, semiconductor manufacturing capabilities. There has been the Made in China 2025 plan and uh, semiconductor is one of the top 10 sectors uh, under this plan. 
This year, China uh, further proposed the uh, so-called New Infrastructure Initiative. Uh, this will provide more incentives for the um, key areas like uh, 5G, industrial internet, data centers, AI in the next uh, five years, which may provide a further catalyst for the growth of China's uh, semiconductor sector. The rise in um, tech protectionism and nationalism um, could bring some challenges for Taiwan. On slide 11, we have a chart showing Taiwan is actually um, sandwiched between uh, China and the US. On the one hand, um, Taiwan still relies on the US for the upstream IC design and the supply of uh, semiconductor equipment and uh, materials. As much as 80% uh, of uh, Taiwan's IP imports are sourced uh, from the US. On the other hand, Taiwan also relies on China for market sales. About 60% uh, of its uh, uh, electronic component exports go to China and Hong Kong markets. So um, Taiwan is vulnerable uh, to the uh, US-China tech war whether it's a uh, U.S. carting of uh, technology supply to the downstream Chinese companies, or whether it's uh, China's uh, restriction of market access for the upstream U.S. tech companies. Although the direct target is not Taiwan, it can hurt Taiwan indirectly um, because Taiwan stays uh, uh, in the middle between U.S. and China. And uh, meanwhile, the supply chain reconfiguration by U.S. and China could also bring some challenges for Taiwan. Um, both the U.S. and China currently are urging Taiwanese uh, semiconductor companies to move production to, to their countries. So um, in response, um, TSMC recently has announced to build a, a new 5 nanometer uh, chip plant in, in, in the U.S. So going forward, if the uh, U.S. and China uh, both uh, strengthen their semiconductor manufacturing capabilities, whether it will eventually weaken Taiwan's uh, comparative advantage uh, in the next, uh, for example, 10 years, uh, this is also something we, we may need to uh, think about. So overall speaking, there are plenty of opportunities for the global tech sector in the uh, post-pandemic world due to the acceleration of uh, digitalization process, but also some challenges due to the complicated uh, geopolitical picture. Um, this is all I have. I think I will uh, pass it back to Taimo. Thank you very much, Tiying. Such an interesting time for Taiwan's uh, tech industry. Um, I want to take you back to your initial arguments about uh, Taiwan's uh, sort of you know, solid status in the world of uh, uh, technology. Uh, we've also been very impressed with the way Taiwan was one of the very first countries in the world to take the pandemic very seriously as early as in December. So I want to start on that issue. That is uh, Taiwan's success in dealing with the pandemic a reflection of its ex excellent technology and healthcare infrastructure? Or would you actually say it was more about the proactive policy making by the government of Taiwan? Uh, it's an interesting question. I think both factors may have uh, played a role. Um, on the one hand, Taiwan indeed reacted very early. Uh, they took actions immediately after seeing the virus outbreak in Wuhan. Um, basically, the government set up the Central Epidemic Command Center as early as uh, January and imposed uh, some kind of uh, border controls, such as uh, uh, restricting the entry of uh, Chinese tourists and checking the um, passengers uh, uh, returning from China. Um, on the technology side, Taiwan has also been doing well. Uh, the government used, uh, for example, the uh, mobile phone location data to, to track the uh, quarantined people to tell uh, whether the quarantine people have uh, stayed uh, uh, at home or whether they have uh, left the uh, assigned locations. And uh, Taiwan also developed uh, some mobile phone apps to track the uh, inventories of, of uh, uh, face masks 
to tell the public where to buy the uh, face masks. So I think both factors have played a role here. Um, but if you compare to other countries in the region and look at at a, like a relative basis, I would say um, the early response uh, probably is a bigger factor explaining why Taiwan has been doing so well in containing the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, Ting, I'm looking at uh, slide three right now, um, the slide where you sort of showed the electronics exports rebounding in recent months. But we should not forget the fact that Taiwan also exports things beyond electronics, uh, particularly on the machinery side. And uh, overall exports growth in Taiwan has been negative for, I think, four consecutive months now. So give us a sense of what's happening beyond the tech stuff. I mean, exports of which products are weak. And also, if you could tell us about, you know, how things are going vis-a-vis -vis specific countries like China, U.S., Southeast Asia, Japan, and Europe, for example. Oh, okay. Um, I think product-wise, the non-electronics exports have uh, remained quite weak. Um, one category is about those uh, commodities-related products like uh, chemicals, metals. Uh, that is in line with the weakness in global commodities markets. And another category is uh, consumer goods like uh, textiles and like uh, motor vehicles. Uh, that is also in line with the weakness in global uh, offline consumer demand. And market-wise, um, exports to Europe, Japan, and uh, Southeast Asia are uh, very weak. They fell at a double-digit rate in recent months. That was due to the uh, lockdown in, in these countries and uh, regions. And exports to China and uh, U.S. are doing relatively well. Um, probably due to the uh, demand in the uh, tech supply chain. So overall, the uh, export growth is in negative territory, but it's a single-digit decline, uh, still um, better than the, some other countries in the region. Of course. Uh, we are also seeing a lot of geopolitical developments with the uh, U.S. particularly, and you already talked about it a bit with respect to uh, access for U.S.-made technology uh, that go into various high-end hardware being built. Um, what about Taiwan? Uh, Taiwan, of course, has a much more precarious situation given its big FDI position in China. But has Ch Taiwan tightened inward investment rules, for example, with China and Hong Kong in mind? And even if they haven't so far, are you hearing news that something like this could be in the pipeline? Uh, yes. In fact, um, Taiwan has been restricting Chinese investment uh, for a long time because of this uh, long-standing national security concerns and also worries about like looting technology advantages. Um, if you look at uh, China's FDI into Taiwan, uh, it's very small amount, probably just about uh, two to three percent of Taiwan's uh, FDI investment in China. And uh, for the tax sector, Mm, Taiwan has uh, especially tight regulations on Chinese capital. There have been some Chinese uh, tech companies trying to acquire uh, Taiwanese uh, tech companies in, in the last several years, like um, uh, China's uh, uh, Tsinghua Uni Group. It has been trying to acquire some uh, Taiwanese semiconductor firms in the last several years, but the transactions uh, failed due to um, uh, regulations from the Taiwanese government. Um, going forward, um, because uh, China now has a um, uh, strong ambition to move up the value chain, uh, including moving up the semiconductor supply chain, Taiwan may find it more necessary to protect its uh, high-end technology. The restrictions on Chinese investments uh, will likely uh, remain in place or, or even tightened in the uh, uh, next uh, several years. Right. Let's stay with this uh, issue on investing at the high end of uh, technology. Uh, tell us a little bit about Taiwan's artificial intelligence ecosystem. I want you to sort of give us a sense of, you know, how much the Taiwanese are investing in there. Um, are we seeing, you know, major entrepreneurs or even large companies coming up with very promising developments? Uh, I see in China, for example, you know, AI in health tech, digital finance, e-commerce is very big. It's a similar story in China. And also, since we are sitting in Singapore and discussing this, can you tell us about if there are any linkages between the 
AI developments in Taiwan and the Southeast Asian supply chain? Um, for the AI development, I think uh, there are two areas. One is about uh, manufacturing, another is about uh, services. For manufacturing, um, Taiwan has been doing well. If you look at uh, Robert's uh, density, Taiwan is uh, one of the highest in Asia, just after South Korea, Singapore, and uh, Japan. Um, Taiwanese manufacturers, in fact, have been actively pushing for the adoption of robots and other smart machines to cope with the challenges like uh, population aging and uh, shortage of labor supply. But for AI application in services like um, uh, healthcare, finance, or e-commerce, I think the process remains uh, relatively slow in, in Taiwan. Um, in fact, uh, the government still has uh, some regulations in the digital areas due to like uh, the uh, security concerns, data privacy concerns. So if you look at the penetration rate of uh, e-commerce mobile payments in Taiwan, in fact, uh, it's uh, still much lower than in, in mainland China today. And accordingly for AI uh, startups, uh, uh, AI investments in the services sector, Although the process has been picking up, but still um, uh, falling behind China. Uh, in terms of the linkage with Southeast Asia, I think Taiwan's AI investment in Southeast Asia, I have not yet seen very uh, significant uh, uh, developments. Um, but we, we saw some Southeast Asian um, AI companies go to Taiwan to uh, recruit uh, Thailand's. Uh, leveraging the uh, human capital uh, in, in Taiwan. So um, overall, I think the for SAT services or, or software, Taiwan, in fact, is not uh, uh, as strong as in SAT manufacturing or, or hardware. Uh, there is still some potential for, for the SAT services sector to, to grow in Taiwan, for AI to grow in Taiwan, given that uh, uh, it has uh, uh, strengths in human resources, in uh, technology capabilities. Um, what it needs uh, probably uh, is um, uh, either regulatory environments uh, that can uh, help to uh, encourage innovation in the uh, new technology areas. Very interesting. Uh, Ting, thank you very much for your insight. There is a lot going on in this area and I'm sure we'll have to sit down for one more webinar a few months from now to take a look at you know, the tech war issue and how that sort of pans out and how Taiwan um, places itself in the middle of this uh, maelstrom. Uh, again, uh, Ting, thank you. Uh, thank you, Taimo. It's a pleasure. Uh, thanks to our listeners for listening in. You have been listening to the Asia Economist webinar. You can find all our research and multimedia by Googling DBS Research Library.